Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for Honors Biology video 9-1. And in this video, we're going to talk about how plants evolved onto land from aquatic green algae. All right, hold on one second. Let me... Uh... All right, so in this video, what we're going to talk about is how plants have evolved onto land and how the first plants are going to be very similar to what we see in modern day green algae. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges that plants faced as they left an aquatic environment and then moved onto land. And then ultimately some of the patterns that we saw as larger plants started to emerge and new groups of plants evolved, leading you up into the 9-2 video, which somebody else will take over for. All right, so here we go. So when we talk about the first plants, the first true plants, they evolved from a group that was very similar to modern day green algae approximately 475 million years ago. And so what does this look like from a cladogram? So over here on the lower right, I have a cladogram of all the different groups of plants. And then you can see that I've branched off here and I've added the chlorophytes. These are the green algae that are most plant-like. And so they're going to share homologies between the plants and this group of chlorophytes. They're going to be green. They're going to have chlorophyll. Many of them are going to have cell walls that are very similar to the cell walls that we see in plants. And so those are some of the homologies we see. Really, we're going to focus in on the pigmentation and the presence of those photosynthetic chloroplasts and uh, mechanisms that are very similar from a metabolism standpoint. And those are going to be really our big homologous characteristics. As we emerge into the first plants, we're going to start seeing things like mosses and their relatives. When I look at mosses, what are mosses? They are non-vascular plants. What does that mean? It means that they have no tissue that gives them, they have no tissue that allows them to conduct water inside the plant. They don't have true roots. They don't have true leaves. They don't have true veins. What they are going to do is they're going to live in a very wet environment. So think about where you find moss in shady, damp, wooded environments. And they're going to need to basically have their tissues constantly bathed in water. They're going to have swimming sperm that are able to fertilize from a male gamete, swim over to the female gamete in order to produce that next generation. And they have very little what's known as a cuticle. So they have very little or no waxy layer to help prevent evaporation. Again, they're in a very wet environment and they do very little to conduct or retain water. So when we look at the fossils, what we see is structures like this early plant that would happen around 450, 475 million years ago. You'll notice that it's not very tall, again, not vascular. It would not have the ability to conduct water because of the lack of vascular tissue. You'll also notice that it doesn't really have many detailed structures. You don't see true leaves on these, and it's a fairly simplified photosynthetic structure. When we look at modern day examples, we would see things like moss, which is up here on the top, or things like liverworts that are down here. Again, very small, low to the ground plants, very little ability to prevent water loss, no cuticle. They're going to produce swimming sperm that swim from the male reproductive structures over to the female reproductive structures. And then they will have the spore producing structures that come out. This is an example of that up here. These are sporangia that are produced. And again, they're not vascular. They cannot conduct fluid with inside the cells. So as we move forward in time, we end up seeing about 350 million years ago, we are in what's known as the Carboniferous period. During this time, we start to see plants evolve into tree and tree-like structures. So before we get into it, I would like you to pause and think, what challenges would exist for plants as they grow taller? Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with was that as plants get taller, they have two challenges. One, they're not going to be bathed in water anymore. So how are they going to get the water from very, very low down in the ground or maybe even in the soil up to leaves that are in trees high above the ground? The other issue you might have thought about is how are they going to have support? And we're not going to delve too much into this, but it is another issue. And we see the evolution of lignin, which is a protein that allows plant to get some structure. I'm not going to say anything else about that, but if you were thinking those lines, that's also another good thought you could have come up with. So when we talk about how they deal with water, vascular tissue is going to come up. They're going to retain the swimming sperm, just like we saw in mosses and their relatives. But in fact, what we'll find is they're going to be much more evolving this ability to conduct and retain water. So you'll also see cuticle forms in there. 
Another thing that comes out around this Carboniferous period about 350 million years ago is the idea of what do these things look like? Well, they are giant trees and they were tree-like structures. That's why trees are in quotes at the top. They didn't have true woody tissue the way we think of now, so they don't have wood like conifers do or wood like a flowering plant would produce, like an oak or a maple, but they were able to make very wood-like tissue and they could go quite tall, hundreds of feet in the air, and now what happens with this is that as those swamps died, it actually was trapping a lot of carbon, and eventually that is going to be in the form of modern-day coal. I'm going to come back to this on the next slide, so I just wanted to preview that briefly. Let's go back to that idea of vascular tissue for a minute. And when we talk about vascular tissue, we're talking about two types of tubes. One is known as xylem, and the other is known as phloem. Xylem is going to conduct water up from the roots up to the leaves, and phloem conducts sugar from the leaves down to the roots or down all the tissue of the plant because most of the sugar is going to be made in the leaves. Now, how does the water get from the soil or from the roots all the way up? What we'll find is that on the underside of leaves, we find these small holes known as stoma or stomata. And what is going to happen is the water is going to evaporate out of those leaf pores. And that evaporation is known as transpiration. The transpiration is the loss of water through the holes on the underside of leaves. As that water transpires out, water molecules, as you know, are attracted to other water molecules. So the water molecule that's leaving is going to be still attached, have hydrogen bonds with the other water molecules. They're still back in the in the plant. And so as it evaporates off, it's going to tug and pull and provide a little bit of transpirational pull on the whole chain of water molecules. That water molecule is going to pull the water molecule behind it and behind it and behind it. And ultimately, it connects all the way down to water molecules that are in the soil. As the water is transpiring out of these leaves, it's going to be pulling all the water molecules all the way from the roots up through those leaves on the underside. All right, so coming back to that idea of coal that we brought up earlier. So we have these giant trees 350 million years ago. As they died and they got buried, they're going to trap a whole lot of carbon underneath the ground. And so if we go to places like Pennsylvania and West Virginia and you dig down in those areas, you find a lot of coal. And that is much of what we use to uh, heat homes, uh, power electricity. A lot of the electricity generation that takes place, particularly in uh, the United States, is derived of coal. And when we call those fossil fuels, the reason we call them fossil fuels is because that's exactly what we're doing. We are burning the buried carbon remains of those coal swamps, those giant fern forests that occurred back in the Carboniferous period, back in our Paleozoic era. All right, so on to the next pattern that we discuss, and that's the reduction of the gametophyte stage of plants. So bear with me here. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you um, here, and I want to talk about the alternation of generations that we see in all plant types. So taking a step back, let's talk about the fact that there's two broad types of tissue that we talk about within plants. Those are known as gametophyte or gamete producing tissue and sporophyte or spore producing tissue. Now, when we went back and we looked at our mosses, our mosses are predominantly, when you see a moss, gametophyte tissue. What that means is that it is a haploid tissue only has one set of chromosomes in those little leaf-like structures. And there'll be plants that produce male gametes and there'll be uh, plants that produce female gametes. And the sperm will swim from the male structures over to the female structures and it will cause fertilization. Well, once we have fertilization, we don't have a haploid structure anymore. We have a diploid structure and that's going to produce sporophyte tissue. The sporophyte is the spore producing tissue. So that sporophyte tissue is going to go through the process of making spores. Now, when a spore is produced and it lands on the ground, a spore is a haploid structure. It's produced by meiosis and it grows into gametophyte tissue. So I just described what happens in a moss. When we come back and look at our ferns, what we end up seeing is that the fern that you see is actually sporophyte tissue. So unlike the mosses, when you look at a moss, you see gametophyte tissue. When you look at a fern, what you think of as a fern, this is actually sporophyte tissue. And when the sporophyte tissue produces spores, those spores land on the ground, they actually produce a whole separate plant, a completely separate plant known as gametophyte plant. And that gametophyte plant is going to have a region that produces male gametes and female gametes. And the male gametes are going to swim over to the female gamete and they're going to produce the fern that we recognize. So we actually can see that when we look at this pictures over on the left on this upper structure. Here is a structure 
that is produced by the sporophyte fern. This right here is where the spores are produced. When those spores land on the ground, they produce these gametophyte structures down here on the bottom. Right here is an example of one of those gametophyte plants that you see produced by a fern. Now these are microscopic plants. These are not nearly as large as the ferns that you're familiar with, but it is a separate plant. Now when the male gamete swims over to the female structure, what we end up seeing is right here, this is actually the beginning of a sporophyte structure right here coming out and growing out, and this is going to give rise to something that looks like a fern that you're familiar with. The reason I bring all of this up is that one of the trends that we see in plant evolution is as plants emerged from the water and moved onto land, we see this successive pattern in a reduction of the gametophyte phase. As I said, mosses and their relatives are predominantly gametophyte. That's what we see. But ferns are a 50-50. And in fact, ferns that we see, they appear to be mostly sporophyte, but they produce this whole separate plant that's gametophyte. When you go to seed-bearing plants, things like conifers or flowering plants, something like a maple tree, those are pretty much all sporophyte tissue. And they produce small gametophyte tissue that comes out of them. In fact, these are kind of the exact opposite of what we saw with the mosses. The moss, remember, is a gametophyte that produces this small sporophyte tissue that's just very specific for replication, not a whole separate plant. When we look at oak trees and that sort of thing, you're going to end up seeing a sporophyte plant that produces some gametophyte tissue buried just for the purposes of reproduction. Right? Why does this happen? I don't know that I want to get into any of that or the hypotheses of that on this video, but I do want you to be aware that this is a pattern that we see, a reduction of the gametophyte over time in plants and a rise in the sporophyte. The last thing I want to talk about is in this second group of plants, uh, I keep saying ferns and their relatives. Some of the other fern uh, relatives that we can say are the ones that are in the pteridophytes um, are things like obviously these ferns, but also things like this horsetail over here. This is going to also produce a sporophyte plant like this and a microscopic gametophyte that you would find in the soil. All right, so I know that was a whole lot of information. Uh, I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.